What makes a good villain? Is it their evil or their humanity? Their likability or their repulsion? Let's take a tour of some of cinema's favorite bad guys and try to find out. These are our picks for the top 10 movie villains of all time. We're starting off at number 10 with the pure evil. It's the bad guy who does bad because it's bad, and since bad is good, good is bad, so he's gotta be good, right? Sure, this might sound like a top candidate for the best villain and a fantastic tongue twister to boot, but it's also the flattest of characterizations. It may have terrified us as kids when boogeymen and black and white morality hid under our beds, and in that sense, these villains will always hold a nostalgic sort of tyranny over us. But we've long since stopped fearing in such simple terms. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't some worthwhile villains who are notable mostly for the pureness of their evil. There's Emperor Palpatine, Damien from The Omen, along with just about any other incarnation of the devil you see in a movie. However, for our favorite pure evil, we tend to like Sauron. I see. Sure, it's hard to compete with an all-seeing, fiery eye in the sky, but there's also something special about the insidiousness of his power. It doesn't corrupt in a handshake or a single exchange for a soul, but slowly, over decades and centuries, enticing its victims with a promise of more. It got Smeagol and Saruman, Boromir and the Ringwraiths, and it gets us because he's our number 10 best villain. So, what works better than pure evil? Well, there's something to be said for the villains that scare the ever-loving shit out of us. These are your classic horror movie monsters, things that go bump in the night, your Freddy Krueger, your Jason Voorhees, your Michael Myers, your Leatherface. And while some of them might seem pretty evil, we actually think their overriding trait is more that they're amoral. They're agents of chaos, they're dangerous and unpredictable, and they could kill anyone at any time, not because they necessarily hate the world, but because they don't not hate it either. And it's not just horror monsters. Characters like Goodfellas' Tommy DeVito, and the shark from Jaws make us brown our drawers just as much as slasher goons. But for our number nine pick, we think it doesn't get much more terrifying than City of Gods' Lil Z. The guy's a badass and a loose cannon in his 20s, but 12-year-old Z breaks into a hotel and murders everyone just for the hell of it. Honestly, Lil Z is way more terrifying in flashbacks, specifically because of this chaos we're talking about. He's violent, ruthless, and unpredictable. He'd just as soon pose for your pictures as shoot a half dozen holes in you, which is why he earns a spot on our list. As cinemagoers, one of the key psychological mechanisms that makes movies so immersive is that we identify with the protagonist. And that's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, but what it really means is that you see the hero, see them as a human being similar to yourself, and then your empathy and mirror neurons kick in so that all of a sudden you find yourself feeling the same way they feel. So you want them to win, because winning will make them, and by extension you, feel victorious. The only thing that gets in your way is the gosh darn villain, which is where our number eight comes in, the villain who is seemingly unstoppable. We're talking relentless, single-minded adversaries who we could not possibly conceive of overcoming. Think Agent Smith or any of the Terminators. No matter what you do, they just keep coming back. They're juggernauts with the memory of elephants. It's Daniel Plainview from There Will Be Blood, Ivan Drago from Rocky IV, and Khan from Star Trek II. But our favorite version of this bad guy is Max Cady from Cape Fear. You know, when I was in the bucket, all I could think about was busting out and killing somebody. Fourteen years ago, I was forced to make a commitment to an eight by nine cell. Now you're going to be forced to make a commitment. We're going to pretend we forgot there were two of these so we can just talk ambiguously and don't have to pick one because they're both so fucking scary. Oh, you're a rapist who spent his entire time in prison planning on how you'd get back at me? Please excuse me while I curl up in a ball and cry for my mother. This guy is unstoppable, literally going to the ends of the earth to get revenge. And we want to reward that effort. A spot on our list for you, sir. Prison rapist. Now maybe there's also something to be said for the relationship between the hero and our villain. So let's go back to 10th grade English Lit where we learned about the foil. No, not from algebra, we're talking about the perfect counter to a hero. The paper to his rock, the yin to his yang, the peanut butter to his jelly, or something like that. Maybe the thing that makes a villain great is his perfect opposition to our hero. The most obvious example here is he who must not be named, aka Voldemort, aka Ween, afraid of that motherfucker, but keep your voice down just in case. His evil magic is so closely tied to Harry's hero magic that they're perfectly matched and evenly opposed. There's also General Zod, Angel Eyes, and Hans Gruber. But for our number seven, is there a better foil out there than the Joker? And why do you want to kill me? <laughs> Kill you? No. No, you. You complete 
me. He is the chaos to Batman's order, the evil to his good, the grin to his grimace. He even sees himself as Batman's foil. He knows it. He revels in being his villain. And with complex character and fantastic acting like that, how can we not give him this spot? Clever opposition aside, there's something to be said about a villain who you just loathe. These are the bad guys who just make your stomach churn, your lip curl, and your blood start boiling. Maybe you don't even like the hero here so much as you just hate the villain. We're talking about the brother betraying Scar, that scummy Noah Cross from Chinatown, and the endlessly chokeable Professor Umbridge. And we love to hate Nurse Ratchet with her stupid hat and stupid hair and her stupid rules. But for our pick, there's not a bad guy we hate much more than Reverend Harry Powell from The Night of the Hunter. Lord, I am tired. Sometimes I wonder if you really understand. Not that you mind the killings. Your book is full of killings. This guy combines child abuse with a smug sense of righteousness and the thinnest veneer of likability. We just want nothing more than to smash his dumb face, which is why he earns a spot on this list. Of course, hate isn't everything. We want to also consider those villains that we like despite the terrible things they do. It takes a certain kind of depth and charisma to earn our admiration all the while terrorizing the townspeople. These are your Lokis, your Bodies, your Alonzo Harrises. It's Harry Lime from The Third Man and Hans Landa from Inglorious Bastards. But is there a badder, more lovable bad guy than Dr. Hannibal Lecter? I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. He's charming, he's intelligent, he's cultured, he eats people's body parts, he's insightful, he's the full package. It's this point in our list where we get our first hint that there's something complex and challenging about good villains. What does it say about us that these are Nazis, murderers, corrupt cops, and cannibals that we find ourselves oddly attracted to? It's a long way from the pure evil of our number 10, and we think we're onto something here, so let's take it one step further. Somewhere between hateable and likable, we find one-dimensional badness sometimes reveals itself to be something a little more human than we expected. Sure, we never really root for these villains, and we sure don't want them to win, but we're hoping for less of a public execution and more like some serious therapy. And that's where things get really terrifying on an existential level. The similarities between them and our heroes start to shrink. The similarities between them and ourselves are less and less. This might be Wu Jin Lee from Old Boy, Tajomaru from Rashomon, or Darth Vader by the end of Return of the Jedi. There's loads of worthwhile three-dimensional villains, but our favorite of all time is Hans Beckert from M. Introduced in the most black and white of terms as a shadow and foreboding whistle, he starts out as a villain so vile that an entire city full of criminals are cast as heroes. But by the end of his underground trial, he cries out for help with a voice of humanity, screaming out from the depths of a psychological prison and casts the entire story into different shades of gray. It's a level of nuance unheard of in most films, which is why it earns a spot on our list. If you think a dose of humanity is scary, what about those villains that look human, sound human, and even put on a good human act, but then turn around and do the complete opposite with no remorse? It's scary and effective because it makes us think, oh god. Are there people like that among us? They fit into humanity, yet contain a capacity for remorseless violence and destruction. It's Peter and Paul from Funny Games, it's Patrick Bateman from American Psycho, it's Eamon Goth from Schindler's List. In a word, it's a psychopath. And they're a really scary kind of villain. HAL 9000 pulls this off in robot form, John Doe from Seven in preacher form, but for our number three, it's really hard to beat Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. Call it. For what? Just call it. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you're dead. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. There's something beyond eerie about the emptiness behind his eyes and the ruthless efficiency and disregard with which he dispatches human life. There's no second thought, no question of right or wrong, just a casual coin flip and f it's starting to seem like the best villains don't just function well in the story, but they also have a complex psychological relationship with the viewers, aka us. So we want to talk about the kind of villain who's taken a normal, everyday sort of madness and distorted it out of proportion. And we think this might be as scary as it is because it seems to say to us, this could be anyone. This could be your husband someday. This could be you. They're Annie Wilkes from Misery, who takes the infatuation everyone feels a little bit and then kidnaps a man. Or Jack from The Shining, whose isolation has turned him into a monster. Or there's Colonel Kurtz and Joan Crawford and Alex Forrest. And our favorite of these villains, Norman Bates. Mother, my mother, uh, what is the phrase? 
She isn't quite herself today. Scarred from emotional abuse and torn to pieces by dissociative identity disorder, Norman is actually just a sweet young boy, which is great, but he's also Norma, a serial murdering old woman. It's painful and difficult to look at these distortions of humanity partly because they're so different from us, but also partly because they're not. Now, if our number two shows us a potential in ourselves, we want to talk about those villains that give us a peek at our deepest subconscious desires right now. And that's terrifying, isn't it? We all have parts of ourselves we are uncomfortable with that we try to push down and hide and pretend aren't there. We all do, right? 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 Anyway, the point is that there's a type of villain that's awesome because they held up a mirror and said, look. Think of Ozymandias allowing himself to do a small evil in order to prevent a bigger one. Or Jigsaw punishing criminals in a way that we might secretly think they deserve. Or Tyler Durden casting aside the shackles of society and embracing violence and disorder and pain. But our favorite villain of this sort is Frank Booth from Blue Velvet. Baby wants to f a girl. Get ready to f you f Holy sh! this is one bad dude. He's a gas-huffing, Paps Blue Ribbon-drinking, sadomasochistic motherfucker. And sure, his sexual deviance is incredibly disturbing to watch, but you're lying to us and yourself if you can't admit that there's some weird Freudian stuff going on at some deep id level with it. It's like watching a perverted car wreck that you can't look away from that hits you somewhere deep and hidden. And that's why he's our pick for the best movie villain of all time. So what do you think? Did you like our take on villains? Do you want us to dissect some of the best heroes too? Let us know by liking this video and give us your take in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix movie lists.